OK, thank you very much, folks. Uh, just to say that uh, I speak to you today as one of your own. I came into youth work as a youth club member when I was 15 years old. I was in a lot of trouble running around with difficult kids. Um, next step for me, probably incarceration. And I happened to go to a youth club one night. And that night changed the course of my life. So when I speak to you about evidence today, I don't need evidence from researchers or anybody else to show me the power of youth work, the efficacy of youth work. But we've all got stories like that, all of us. And stories like that are not good enough for policymakers and the people who control the money these days. So we have to speak to them on the basis of a different understanding of evidence. And we have to speak to them very clearly about the benefits of our work. So that's really the kind of work that I'm involved in these days, which is trying to provide a substantial basis, an argument really, for the worth of youth work and the benefits of youth work that don't just speak to youth workers, they speak to other professionals and they speak to the people who control the funds and develop the policy, okay? So, aims for this input. Uh, I just want to go through different sources of evidence. This, this word evidence is banded about a lot and I just want to un unpick that with you. Um, and then in the second part of what I talked to you ab about today, I will talk to you about a theory of change. Now, that's already sounding a bit like jargon. But I guess all of you in this room are in the business because you think you're going to make a difference. You're going to work alongside or with young people to make a difference. Otherwise, no point actually is there. So we're all in the change business. So what is that change about? That's what I'm really concerned with. Yeah. So why now? Why evidence now? Um, in the UK recently, you probably don't follow this, but there was a commission of inquiry set up by the government. And that commission of inquiry was to look at youth services. And they took witnesses, what they called expert witnesses, from the field. Now, the UK is an interesting case study because the longest tradition of writing about youth work is in the UK. The longest tradition of writing about it. There's something like 60 universities training youth and community workers in the UK. That's probably the greatest number any, in any country in the world, including America. So there you would expect a basis of, of understanding and knowledge. The committee concluded, and I could give you chapter and verse on this, they concluded there is no credible evidence for youth work beyond anecdotes and stories. None. Nothing reliable. They spent six months looking at this and they had all these people in front of the committee. Now, I'm saying that is very dangerous stuff for youth work because they walk out of that, particularly if it's a right-wing conservative government, they walk out of that kind of inquiry and they say, no evidence equals what? No, no money, that's it. So you and I, at this time we didn't ask for it, but we find ourselves in positions of responsibility. And it's up to us to make the case. Yeah? And we have to make the case in particular kinds of ways. So that's why I'm interested in the evidence issue. Yeah? OK, so evidence is important because it helps us to understand things. It helps us to determine how we should go about our practice. It helps us to make a case to people. And it helps us to have sensible discussions about what we should be doing and how we should be doing it. So it's not just your opinion, it's not just my opinion. What can we turn to in terms of evidence that can settle arguments, that can settle differences of opinion? So that's where evidence comes into to play. It's not just you, it's not just me, it's not just my experience. There's something else here that we can talk about in a kind of objective way. Okay. Now, there are particular views of evidence about. Anybody heard of the Allen inquiry? Graham Allen? Nope, another Conservative MP. Again, in the UK, a commission of inquiry. And what did the Allen inquiry find? The Allen inquiry found that if you're going to spend your money wisely, you should spend your money on early intervention. 
the idea is that you head off problems and they're always thinking about problems you know, at the pass. So you spend your money on early intervention. But you don't just spend your money on early intervention. You should spend your money on those programs that have been proven to work. Now, anybody familiar with family-centered therapy, for example? Nope. Anybody familiar with the idea of an evidence-based program? Yeah. OK, I'm going to talk to you a little bit, a little bit more about these. But what Alan said to the, to the government there, and this is coming, folks, you know, what is said there spreads out. Here's 19 programs, 19, and he named them, listed them, that you should be spending your money on because these have been proven to work, OK? So what's the implications of that? So we'll fund those. We'll fund those things because they've been proven to work. And now you put those two things together, there's no credible evidence. But over here, we've got these evidence-based programs and they work, right? That's what we're up against at the moment. So that's why the evidence question is so crucial today. And we have to be able to answer that question. Um, these are all hyperlinked. You get these slides. So you can go and have a look at these particular places. Now, these are American-based. They will list these different kinds of programs. Most of them are about working with very young people, children, or they're about working with families. Very few of them are about working in community-type settings, the kind of work that you are used to, or with the kinds of young people that you are working with. But some of them are. And some of them are close enough. And if you have a look at these programs, what characterizes them is they set out the theoretical base, they set out the rationale for the work, they set out the program. So what do you do on day one? What do you do on day 20? What do you do on day 30? How do you measure what you're doing? And they'll give you the instruments. So what I'm saying is this, have a look. Don't just dismiss them out of hand because they've done some good things. I would love it if we could set out very clearly in that way our theoretical basis and the ways in which we work with, with young people that are more rather than less likely to have an impact and that that is substantiated. Okay? So I would say have a look at these. But I'm not saying at all that's the way we need to go as youth, as youth workers. Thank you. And it's not just me. Okay? So I'm not just somebody else here with my opinions and, and my experience. This is Professor Sandra Nutley, who is a world-famous expert on knowledge transfer. So we had Sandra talking to us not long ago when she was addressing um, a group of people very much like yourselves about what is evidence. So what did she say? She says we need to know more than what works, OK? We need to know about the causes of problems. So it's not just the problem. What are the causes, and can we get at the causes? We need to know why we're doing what we're doing. And the key relationship here is the relationship between what we do and our value base. So I'll come on to that again. And that's absolutely crucially central and important for youth workers. It's important for all professional people. But for youth workers, like community workers, it's probably the most central thing. So the relationship between what we do and the value base. Then we need to know how to put things into practice and we need to know who to involve, who are our kind of allies and who are our partners. OK, thank you. So from Sandra's point of view, it's about the best available evidence. It's not just the stuff about what is proven to work in particular programs for particular purposes. What we need to bring into play is the best available evidence. Thank you. And where do we get this from? Here's a very simple diagram. And note the different parts of it. One place that we get evidence from is from talking to young people. This is what I mean by consultation, from talking to people in communities. We need to talk to them about what they think about things. We need to talk to them about what they think about us and what we have done with them. So that's a very, very crucial part of what we mean by the, the evidence triangle. Okay? We could talk to peers. You could talk to each other. You could talk to experts 
in the field. You could consult in a very systematic way. You can do surveys, you can do questionnaires, you can do community conferences, you can do a whole range of, of things to engage with and get those ideas and views from people, and particularly young people. Then there's practice. So all of you have tremendous experience in this field. If you look at the combined number of years just in this room alone, never mind in the field as a whole, but just in this room alone, yeah? And that is worth a lot. The development of understanding, the development of practices, the commitment to certain kinds of values, processes, all of that is worth a lot. Sometimes it's captured. So sometimes we've got it in guidelines, sometimes we've got it in evaluations, sometimes we've got it in reports. But often it's not. Often it's just locked up inside individual people. And when they move on, it goes. It goes with them. So we have to find a way where that isn't just inside people. That experience isn't just an individual thing. It somehow becomes a collective thing, that it's out there. We've got to somehow capture that. Um, another piece is policy. I'm going to give you examples of these in a, in a second. So policy is often put together through extensive processes of consultation. It's often put together by drawing in experts. It's often put together on the basis of a literature review. So what policy says is often very well informed. Now I'm not saying, therefore, all policy is great. I'm not saying that at all. But at least there's an attempt systematically to get the information and put the, put the ideas together. And then finally, the piece in the middle is about research and I'm including in that is evaluations. Okay, from research and evaluations. Now, I have to say to you that research and youth work are strangers to each other. So research has not been particularly blessed by a commitment on the part of academics or professional researchers to really get in and do the research that can then be passed on and, and translated the learning. And there's lots of reasons for that. But compared to, say, social work, compared to that, there is a dearth of research, there's a dearth of, of literature. So we're coming from a low base in that respect. Now, the best available evidence means putting all of this stuff together. Okay? It doesn't mean automatically following what you get from the consultation, what you get from what you did previously, what you get from the policy, what you get from the, from the research. It means making decisions on the basis of all that information coming in. So you're at the center of this. The professional, the decision maker, you're at the center of this. And that's what I'm suggesting, that you have to pull from these different sources. Thank you. Here's an attempt by the um, City of Dublin Youth Service Board to represent that rather crude triangle in a more sophisticated way. Uh, and you, you, you will have access to this later on. Yep. This is an example from the NQSF. So this is policy. You're all familiar with this, I think. You will all have seen this. So these, what's on this page doesn't just arrive there from somebody like Connor said sitting in behind a desk somewhere and making it up. There's an extensive process of consultation that gets this kind of thing onto the, onto the page. So this is, in my view, this is evidence. This is what I would include in that kind of evidence piece. Yeah. Evidence from research. There is literature about. A lot of it is American, and it's because they get the funding to do it, primarily because they get the funding to do it. But there is literature from around the world that directly relates to your work. And it's partly a job for somebody like me to access that and translate it and to make it, the findings from it, available to people. I wouldn't expect in your daily practice people to be plowing through all, all of this stuff. But what I wanted you to know was two things. One, it is there. And we have pulled it it together in the literature review that we commissioned from the Institute of Education. That's the first time in the history of youth work in the world that anybody's done that. A systematic attempt 
to get the research literature from around the world into one place. So that's the first time that that has, has happened. And I can tell you that because I started out on this process trying to find out what research had been done some time ago, and I, I could hardly find any. So we had to get this outfit, professional outfit, to try to get this stuff together. But evidence from practice. There's a movement in the UK. It's called In Defense of Youth Work. Have you come across In Defense of Youth Work? No. There are a group of people who are extremely concerned about what is happening to youth work and the way that it's either been marginalized or the funds are being withdrawn or youth workers have been drawn into types of work that are very, very targeted and very, very kind of problem oriented. And the danger is that youth work as we know it, the kind of core youth work that we, that we want to nurture and protect, gets either underfunded or it gets shoved into these other kinds of areas. So they have a movement and they've produced a book. And in this book, they set out a number of stories from practice. And what they did was they got some practitioners to volunteer to write about the work, but they did a peer review process. So there was a systematic questioning of what people were saying and then enabling people to write that in a clear and succinct way. This is very instructive because we do need these accounts. We do need these accounts that are clearly written. And here's a number in this book, which is free. You can download it from that link. And you would all recognize the sorts of practice that they are talking about. And there's a very clear their testimony to the value of the work, why we're doing it, and what comes out of it. Thank you. Um, in the book, they're, they're particularly keen to draw attention to the importance of certain underpinning values, and you will know them all. So it's about developing a respectful relationship. It's about working with young people as partners. It's about building the agenda together. It's about trying to develop a democratic practice where decision-making is joint. All of those kinds of things. It's about an anti-racist, anti-discriminatory practice. All of those are absolutely fundamental, and they show you in, in, in this book how work that is trying to be based on those sorts of principles can, can be done. So it's a good read, very readable, very nicely presented. Yep, next one. Uh, here's three stories. One story I'm going to pick out, a coffee bar. So this is a story uh, about what looks like a chance conversation between a worker and a young person. And the young person saying, I'm lost, I'm in a bit of trouble, don't know what the hell to do, I'm not satisfied. Da, da, da. And the worker says, have you thought about going to university? See? Now, at that moment, at that time, ding, a light goes on in that young person's head. Okay? So from that one conversation and that one remark, lots of other things developed. Now, I know that that story is a true one because that's the story I was telling you about. That's me. That's me. That story is about me, and that happened to me. So I know the, the, the power of this. Of course, it wasn't just that one conversation. I was a member of a youth club, and lots of activities were taking place in that youth club, all of which were stretching me, challenging me, making me into a different kind of, kind of human being. And in that environment, certain conversations can be very powerful because they strike a chord at the right time, in the right place, when young people can be receptive. Coming to the end of this uh, first piece, what we have um, had to do as part of our work in supporting the, the NQSF, and now I'm talking about the Centre for Effective Services, is to find out there in what is known technically as the grey literature, okay, sources. Sources of useful information, sources of evidence, materials, guidelines, books, tools, Instruments. Somebody said, in fact, a few people said when I was listening to you, to you talking er, earlier on about the need for practical tools, instruments, practical ideas. That, that resonated er, around the room. <clears throat> There's a wealth of stuff, actually, out there. Each one of these routes relates to the NQSF principles. Each one. And each one is a hyperlink. And each one will take you 
to a very useful, rich source of material. So if you want to know how to conduct a needs analysis in a community, the top line is where you would start. There's lots of very useful stuff there, very tried and tested stuff. All of this is freely available and you can download it. And you can work your way around this resource. And we'll go now to the, to the final one. I just want to make an end here and I want to go to the next piece. Have you heard of Kolb's learning cycle? Yep. Yeah. Kolb's learning cycle? Yeah, experiential learning. Yeah. Now, most people, I think, most youth workers in, in their, their training or their experience have come across this, this notion. Okay? So, a concrete experience. Your first uh, reaction to it is kind of emotional and intuitive. Uh, and then you think, mm, what do I need to do here in order to address this situation? Then you think, right, well, I'll try x, you try x, it makes a difference, so we're, we're into a new cycle. Now, most people are familiar about that, okay? Now, you can do this as an individual, you can do this as a group. Actually, you can do this as a whole organization. You can do it instantaneous, a nanosecond. Every one of you sitting there now is going around this cycle. Every single one of you. In seconds flat, you're making decisions, okay? And the decision might be, right, I'm going to have another look at this page because I'm fed up. Or I'm going to write something down. Okay? But those are, that's an example of this continuous process. Now, what I'm going to do later is expand this and talk about it in terms of a theory of change. So you're all used to this. You're all doing it to some extent. It's what I would call the core of an evidence-informed approach. That is an evidence-informed approach, but it's located in the, in the individual. So the next bit, when I talk to you again about a theory of change, I'm going to take that and I'm going to expand it into something that you can do collectively. So it isn't just something that's in the individual, but it's a collective exercise. OK? So thanks. That's, that's the, my, my first input. And thank you very much for, for listening. <clears throat>